What is this new virtual world that we are about to enter and how do we go about building it? My starting premise is this is the most important thing that humanity will ever build, a virtual world to rival the real world. And how do you do that? And I shouldn't hide from the very beginning that I see crypto as part of that project. After many years of trying to come up with my own view on what crypto is all about, this is, uh, this is where I am right now, that crypto is a ladder towards a virtual world that we're trying to build. Let me tell you a little bit about my book, History Has Begun, where I describe a theory of virtualism. How do we build a society built on, on, on virtual reality? And also my manifest of virtualism that was sold as an NFT in 2021 and that you can find easily, I think, on OpenSea or Zora uh, if you want to take a look. And it's up 15 points of how to build a virtual world. I'll start with NFTs very briefly, and then we'll move on to currency, monetary history, and uh, Ether and how Ether fits into that. This happened just uh, yesterday or a couple of days ago. Damien Hirst, a famous contemporary artist, burned a number of his works, I think uh, a thousand of his works. You can see some of the works uh, hanging there on the wall. Uh, and he burned them because they had been sold as NFTs and the buyers were able to choose whether they wanted to keep the NFT or whether they wanted to keep the physical object. And they could only keep one, which I think is an interesting premise. Interesting, of the 10,000 that were sold, about half, 5,000, chose the NFT and therefore the physical work was destroyed and half chose the physical work and the NFT was destroyed. Hearst does it with considerably, considerable style. You see here, this is almost a medical COVID-like operation by which he destroys the, the works. And here he is uh, looking attentively at that. There won't be any slides. Let me make a, a few initial comments. Uh, I see this as, not a big fan of Damien Hearst, but I see this as a very interesting premise that NFTs only make sense if there is no physical object that it, they correspond to. That the virtual object, the NFT, cannot really survive if there is a physical object on the side. And you have to pick whether you want the physical object or you want the virtual object. Where I think that Hearst is not going far enough, and most of us are not going far enough, is that in this case, the NFT still refers to a physical object. It's there on the walls. And even if it's destroyed, it was there to begin with. We still haven't figured out how to have NFTs that don't refer to physical reality at all, how to truly embrace this symbolic gesture of destroying the physical object. That's what I like about this, the, the symbolic gesture of destroying the physical object and being left only with the virtual object. Now, how do we do that? And I think the answer is more or less clear. I'm interested in, in how you're thinking about that uh, yourselves. NFTs cannot be a JPEG, cannot be a painting, cannot be a video. NFTs have to be a form of access, permission to a program, to a metaverse of some kind. It's very different to have a painting you can hang on the wall and there's an NFT corresponding to it, but is this really what we want? You know, the NFT is in your wallet on the blockchain, but in fact, when you show it to your friends, you show it on the wall, perhaps a video on a screen that you have in your apartment. This is not what we want. We want an NFT that lives entirely on the blockchain, that is entirely a virtual object. And this can only happen with some kind of metaverse. If you hang your painting on a metaverse, a virtual object on a metaverse, what is really happening here is that you're having access to the metaverse program you are becoming a co-creator in that metaverse. And that's what an NFT is about. An NFT is a form of power over a virtual environment. With an NFT, you become a co-creator in that environment. An NFT is not a physical object and does not refer to a physical object. An NFT can take the form of a painting that you hang on a virtual apartment in a virtual building in a virtual world. That already uh, involves some access and deployment of the metaverse program. But more radically and more interestingly, a metaverse would be, for example, the ability to drive a car in the metaverse, where the access to the program is much deeper and allows for much more functionality. And many other possibilities, as we know, in the future. If you operate a shop in the metaverse, you have an NFT 
that allows you to operate that shop. This, I think, is much more interesting than the commerce-driven idea of NFT as giving you property and perhaps access to income. The NFT gives you power to enter the code, to enter the program of a virtual world. Now, with this in mind, with this symbolic gesture of destroying the physical world and migrating fully to a virtual world, how do we think about money? And uh, I hope I'll give you a broad perspective uh, rooted in monetary history of how, in fact, we are very close to what I would call the holy grail of monetary economics. What is, mo what is money? Money is not real. Money is virtual. And by definition, it has to be virtual. I think many people today in our society still have an enormous difficulty accepting this. The money is the most sacred thing they can think of, and the idea that it is not real, that it is virtual, is very disturbing. And you see a lot of resistance to this. A little later, I'll argue that Bitcoin is a very good example of how people do not accept money as virtual and kind of retrace back to the idea of money as a physical thing. And you know that Michael Saylor, for example, is now very interested in this idea that money is energy. So we're now suddenly converting money back into something entirely physical, when I'm going obviously to disagree with that. But I think, on the other hand, it's becoming easier and easier for us to think of money as virtual. Uh, a good turning point was, I think, the financial crisis of 2008, where everyone suddenly realized that rather than being something very solid, very sound, money was a set of entries into a computer program that could be changed at will. And a lot of money could suddenly disappear, be canceled or transferred for someone else, and banks that were bankrupt suddenly the next day were not bankrupt because someone had turned a switch in a central computer. For many people, this was traumatic and still is, and it's affected our politics very deeply, but it was a learning moment of money as virtual. Many people in the system already knew this, but I think 2008 was a moment when the public in general suddenly woke up to that reality. Crypto, I think, is also part of this learning process. Perhaps some of you are going to resist the idea that crypto is not real, that it is virtual. But I think it's easy to make the argument that it is virtual. After all, before 2010, before 2008, there was no crypto. So it can't be something that has always existed like gold. It's something that is created. It's a product of free creation. Five Eight years ago, Bitcoin was worth, I don't even remember, almost nothing. And today, uh, it is worth, uh, I think, uh, about uh, 20,000 one Bitcoin. So how does this correspond to something real and not to the way we look at it, not to a virtual world? And finally, and this is very much in, in the line of my, of my work, what happened to Russian central bank reserves back at the beginning of March, you remember that after Russia invaded Ukraine, Janet Yellen and Mario Draghi had a phone conversation and they came up with the idea that the reserves that the Russian Central Bank had in Europe and the United States were going to be frozen. And it turns out that all these treasuries and bonds were not something that Russia had. They were, again, only an entry in a computer program and they could be disconnected from central banks in the UK, in the US and in Frankfurt, the European Central Bank. Even cash that Russia had in facilities at these European Central Banks was suddenly cancelled. Very easy to cancel. You just have to ban your central banks from dealing with the Russian Central Bank. And suddenly, all the 300 billion of reserves that the Russian Central Bank has parked in Western Central Banks have been frozen and cannot be touched. Think about this, that the, the very top, the apex of the money hierarchy, treasuries suddenly evaporated and Russia found out overnight that it no longer had that, those 300 billion. In the future, I can conceive very easily that this will be used again. And not after a phone call between two central bankers, uh, now converted into uh, politicians, but actually demanded by the public. Imagine 10 years from now, Bolsonaro is still president of Brazil, the Amazon is burning, Bolsonaro doesn't do anything. What can we do? We're not going to send our military there. But how about we communicate to Bolsonaro that his reserves have been frozen and they will only be unfrozen if he does, if he does something about the Amazon. It's very easy to do. 
I think the genie is out of the bottle and it will be very difficult to stop this. This affects how we think about money because suddenly it's difficult for many developing countries to park their reserves in Western countries as they're always thinking about what could happen in the future. And the way this is going to affect the dollar is, is a very important story. 2008, crypto, geopolitics, and the way geopolitics has also transformed the way we think about money. I think if you think about this, there is clearly a sense in our societies today that money has evaporated, that we lost hold of money, that is something that can be manipulated at will by the elites of the people in charge. There is now a desperate search to find a kind of money that cannot be manipulated in this way, which is, of course, a goal very central to crypto. Economists call a form of money that cannot be touch a form of outside money as opposed to what I've described so far inside money. What is outside money? Is money that does not correspond to a liability or to a promise to pay or to an obligation. If you have treasuries, they are essentially a promise that the Fed has to give you that money back. If you have a bank deposit, it's a promise the bank has given you to return your money. But if you have gold, there's no promise. No one is needs to, to promise to, your gold is yours, it's an object that you can hold and have property in without any corresponding liability. And that's what makes it solid and sound. It's an actual, uh, it's an actual thing rather than just a promise. All the other forms of money, if you think about it, they, are, they turn out to be forms of credit. They turn out to be promises to pay, not real money. There's a search for a form of outside money for many people it would be gold, for many others it would be Bitcoin because the same applies to Bitcoin. When you have Bitcoin, it's not that anyone owes you Bitcoin, particularly if it's not in, a, in an exchange. Uh, but even in an exchange, it's a different question. It's a sort of storage. It's not like a security where the security itself is a promise that someone has made to pay. So what form of outside money can we find? Well, an obvious candidate would be gold. And for many people, the beauty of gold is that it is a form of outside money. It stands gold, doesn't correspond to any promise, to any form of credit. But the problem with gold is the opposite. Even though it's a form of outside money, it's not a form of virtual money. Remember, we want to have a form of virtual outside money. A money that is not a promise to pay, but that is virtual. And throughout history, people have been very aware that gold had serious problems. And the serious problems were essentially that it's not programmable. It's not virtual. It's not programmable. It's just a thing. It's a physical thing. The problems with the gold standard were obviously, as Ben Bernanke said at one point, the, the money supply cannot be adjusted according to economic circumstances. I've already mentioned Michael Siller and Ben Bernanke, and I get, didn't get any booze. Uh, for any of them, <laughs> very, very nice, very polite. But um, so uh, gold cannot be adjusted according to economic circumstances. Economic adjustment takes place very slowly in the gold standard through prices and through salaries, slow and painful adjustment. You don't have the ability to adjust uh, the money supply. Uh, you don't have the ability to increase in a true gold standard. You don't have the ability to increase the money supply as the economy grows, to adjust money creation to GDP growth. All these are fatal flaws when it comes to building a genuine uh, economy. Monetary history, and this is very clear in the book uh, by David Graeber that, that I understand lots of people here like and lots of people in the Ethereum community like, Greber describes a permanent tension, oscillation between two views. On the one hand, money as a real thing. On the other hand, money as a virtual thing. And from the point of view of what I've talked about so far, you understand this tension and this oscillation. On the one hand, you want money to be something real that cannot be freely manipulated by those in power. So you turn towards gold, for example. But then, when you embrace the gold standard, you end up with a problem that it's not programmable. And you cannot build a modern economy on a form of money that is not programmable. And then you return, as you did after 1971, abandoning the gold standard, you return to a form of virtual programmable money, which is what we have today. But then you run into the problem that it's not really money. 
It's just credit. Today, all the money around us is credit. It's not money. So you see, the, the goal here, the holy grail, is to have a form of money that is virtual, but that when it becomes virtual, does not stop being money and does not turn into credit. The turn towards virtual money often destroys money and turns it into credit, but the turn towards physical reality also destroys money because it turns it into a physical object. A piece of gold is not what we call money and is not what we want from money. So I already mentioned Sailor, this idea that Bitcoin is a real thing, it's a quantum of energy, each Bitcoin corresponds to a quantum of energy, and apparently he likes this. But I think the view in the Ethereum community is quite different, as we'll see. Um, is, is Bitcoin virtual? Or does actually the Bitcoin community kind of refrain from going all the way and accepting a form of, of virtual crypto? Crypto does offer the promise of combining what people used to think was impossible, combining the idea of virtual money with the idea of outside money. A money that is virtual but does not correspond to an obligation or credit or promise to pay. I would argue, and I'll, I'll finish with that, I will argue that Ether is, like Bitcoin, a form of outside money. Again, if you have one ETH, no one owes you one ETH, it's yours. It's you, the relationship is between you and the ETH, and there's no one else, there's no third party. This is what defines outside money. But, as opposed to Bitcoin, uh, uh, I, th I, I, I think this is how I would distinguish Bitcoin from, from Ethereum, the idea of uh, virtuality. As opposed to Bitcoin, uh, Ether is also a form of virtual money. And I'll make uh, two preliminary arguments, not being an expert uh, and talking to an audience of experts on Ethereum. Uh, two initial comments. First of all, the idea of layer one and layer two and roll-ups. I find the idea very promising and very intriguing because it allows you to do what money always has to do, to have a level of elasticity, to be able to expand according to circumstances, not just according to economic growth, but to kind of follow people in what they want to do. You don't want a form of money that is a restriction on economic activity. You want a form of money that allows people to do different things. Now, in the system that we have today, that's also possible. I can personally create money. If I pick someone in the audience and I say, you know, uh, a year from now, uh, I will give you uh, a house in Florida, and here is an IOU. This IOU is actually a form of money, and then the question is whether you trust me and you accept it. So I can, two of us can, can create a form of money, and we want to have an ecosystem where this is possible. Now, I think roll-ups in layer two allow this to be possible. People can create different apps on top of the Ethereum network to do different things, and they can create their own currencies. These currencies are going to be different from Ether, in ways we're going to talk about now, but you can create these currencies, and you can do whatever you want to do with other economic agents uh, and, and create all kinds of utilities and functionalities. And Ethereum allows you to do this. There is a hierarchy. During periods of economic uh, normalcy and perhaps during periods of expansion, all forms of money and all forms of credit seem to be the same. In the current fiat system, in periods of expansion, Money in deposits is essentially the same as money as cash. But in a period of crisis, suddenly you realize that deposits are not real money and cash, even though I don't think that cash is outside money, it's still a form of inside money, but it's a form of inside money that is getting a little bit outside. We can talk about that. Cash is better than deposits. And I think in the Ethereum community, you can have something similar. And in periods of expansion, all the apps on, on layer two look the same as Ether. In periods of contraction and discipline, it turns out that they're not quite the same. And the collateral is gonna be recalled, and it turns out that Ether is much more solid. What distinguishes the hierarchy is that even though on layer two you can create whatever you want, it's critical that on layer two you cannot create Ether. Ether is, 
is in a higher level, in the hierarchy of money is in a higher level, and it's that sense that on layer two you cannot create ether. It's that sense that provides discipline to the system. At the same time that having a layer two and having roll-ups allows you to have elasticity so that the Ethereum, uh, the Ethereum economy, just like the fiat economy that we have today, can expand and contract according to economic circumstances. What is the difference between the Ethereum community economy and the fiat economy that we have today? It expands and contracts according to what a decentralized system of billions of economic agents decide to do. It does not contract and expand according to the decisions of a central authority. So it allows you to do the same without the flaws of the fiat system. The second way and here I'll talk with a lot of trepidation. I, I heard Justin Drake yesterday talking about ultrasound money. I'm still trying to digest and to understand uh, everything that is involved here. But I was struck, and I'll finish with this, I was struck by this idea that uh, in the Ethereum uh, economy, in the Ethereum system, money can be destroyed. It is permanently being created and destroyed. There's permanently issuance and burning of ether, which seems to me a radically different way of thinking about money than perhaps every previous way of thinking about money, and certainly from Bitcoin as well, because it breaks with the taboo that money is a physical thing that has an existence of its own. The idea is that we have control over ether, and we can create a system where if it's necessary for ether to be issued for reasons of providing security to the system, to the network, that can be done. But then it can also be freely destroyed and consumed by the system. And you have a kind of permanent cycle of creation and destruction. In the Ethereum system, ether is in the service of the system. As David Hoffman told me yesterday, this is very different from Bitcoin, where Bitcoin system is in the service of Bitcoin, the currency. But this, I believe, one way to put it is that Ether is really the code of an economic metaverse and Ether is understood as a virtual currency in a way that Bitcoin is not. Finish with two minutes to spare or perhaps even seven minutes to spare. Very glad to answer your questions. Uh, please don't ask me questions about proofs. Uh, I, I, I am not uh, the best person to answer that, but uh, very, very happy to answer all your questions. Thank you. Is there an uh, issue for the moneyness of Ether that it's not backed by men with guns? It's not backed by? Men with guns. Yes. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think it is. Uh, Every political system is ultimately based on the monopoly of violence. So how do we solve this problem for, for Ethereum? Um, that's one of the reasons I think, and I've argued with many people in, in the crypto community, that this approach that we're going to do whatever we want to do and political authorities will have to go along seems to me naive. And that uh, if Ethereum or crypto are going to take over, our economies are going to become the center of our economies, this will have to be a process of transformation from within with high levels of cooperation with political authorities. If there is a confrontation, the sense that cryptography is resistance to violence uh, seems to me profoundly naive uh, because there are many ways, and I think over the past year or two, people in the crypto space have discovered this, there are many ways that you can use violence to destroy crypto. So the way I see it is perhaps in one article that I published a couple of years ago, I thought that the tax issue would, would be central, that uh, eventually there might be some kind of agreement compromise between political authorities and crypto, that uh, crypto acquires a certain of evil, uh, invulnerability to political coercion in exchange for some form of access and, and some form of collaboration with political authorities on the taxing issue. But I feel very strongly that this has been done cooperatively throughout the process. And I'm kind of optimistic that I see in my contacts with, with the crypto space that there's been a lot of evolution on this point and that sense of that we are in a deadly confrontation with fiat and political authorities is slowly disappearing and a more constructive attitude is developing. 
Thanks. We have six minutes, so if you want. Hello. Uh, I want to ask you, how do you think is going to be the transition from fiat money that we have today to virtual money, especially regarding uh, how fast this is going to be and how traumatic this is going to be? I, I think it will be traumatic. That I agree with a kind of consensus view in, in the community. I don't think, and you can probably tell from my, from my comments, I don't think the question is really about inflation. I don't think the, the, the and again, Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoiners are, are very obsessed with the idea of inflation. The question for me is fundamentally about this search, which is becoming more and more desperate for a form of outside money. That, that the system we have, where money has really disappeared, I would go so far as to say, we live in an economy where there is no money. There's only credit, there's credit everywhere, and everything is credit. Even cash is credit, because after all, cash is a promise to pay a certain basket of goods, and with inflation of 10%, this is, I think, a point where inflation is important, that promise evaporates. But even in India, in 2016, banknotes were recalled, coercively recalled, and so even cash is not the kind of money we want. There is today in our societies more and more discontent with the sense that we don't have anything like money. Uh, we have forms of credit that are obviously under the control of the creditors and debtors are subject to relations of power. I think it's a very political question of this kind and it is also geopolitical. The system today works because at the top, at the apex, it's the dollar. The dollar is quite interesting because even though it's not a form of outside money, it is hierarchical superior. I think I would argue that uh, even treasury bills are hierarchical superior to cash if the cash is in a different currency. At the top of the system is the dollar. But then the question you have to ask yourself is not a question that is discussed in, in the crypto space a lot is to what extent is the system reliant on the survival of the dollar as the top of the pyramid and how much is that survival of the dollar at the top of the pyramid dependent on American geopolitical power and America's ability to project and impose its power worldwide. Now that that power is in crisis and increasingly under pressure, what impact will that have on the monetary system? Can the monetary system survive without an hegemonic power at the top. And I, I would argue it can't. And we're seeing already the, uh, the, the waves of that. And of course, I advise you to be very attentive to what is happening this week, both in the UK with guilds. And yesterday, Janet Yellen said that she is extremely concerned by the lack of demand for treasuries. Uh, so things are happening. Hi, uh, my question is, could you give a real life example of why it's a shortcoming that gold is not programmable? Yeah, many, many ways to do it. I mean, the most Prozac problem is, since it is a physical object, there's problems of storage, there's problems of transfer, there are problems of movement. You cannot program it in the sense of determining that at your death, your supply of gold will be divided between your children in three parts. I mean, you can tell a bank to do this, but you cannot program the gold itself, but obviously you can program Ether to do this very easily. So at very prosaic level, it's this. Then at a more systemic level, it's an economic question of how do we, for example, counteract pressure, a certain heating up of the economy? How do we adjust the economy uh, to different circumstances? And we know from economics this is necessary. I'm sure there's a lot of resistance in this room to this idea of adjusting the economy. But I would suggest that the resistance is to the idea that a central authority will do this adjustment. But if the adjustment is being done by everyone collectively, I don't see that that is such a big problem and I don't see how a modern economy can work in that way. We've gone through booms and busts in the gold standard, extremely painful adjustments, and most economic historians that I respect think that the two world wars were directly connected to the inability to um, have some control of our economies. The idea of the virtual world is that we are in control as human beings. It's not that reality is in control. Hi, 
uh, over here. Very, very nice talk. I found it really, I found it really thought provoking. And um, I wanted to ask you about these properties of money as both virtual currency and debt representation. Um, over the last couple of improvement proposals, Ethereum has effectively implemented deflationary properties. And I wanted to ask what you think about this and if this can affect uh, Ethereum as virtual currency and real money. Yes, so as I said, uh, what I find interesting is just so Justin thinks that it's the first currency that is deflationary. Not that it has a deflationary impact on prices, but that the currency itself is deflationary, that the money supply will reduce. I'm not entirely sure that economists might argue that fiat in some circumstances can also have these characteristics when the central bank decides to contract the money supply. But I do think it's different, and I think it is a revolution in the way we think about money, the sense that money can be destroyed, the sense that money is just a, 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 a code, a social code, a way of organizing society and not a physical thing. And yesterday I was thinking after Justin's talk that it actually seems to make intuitive sense to me that as you use money, part of it has to be consumed. When you use oil, you don't end up with the same amount of oil that you started. When you go to a shop and buy something, why should you end up with the same amount of money? Some of it should be consumed as it is uh, in, in transaction fees uh, in the Ethereum system. But then, of course, you also have to create it. And it allows you, I think, I would like to know what Justin thinks about this, but it allows you to, the more ether is burned, the more ether can be created. And the sense that you can create ether uh, also allows you to do lots of things that, for example, Bitcoin uh, will not be able to do in terms of providing for the security of the system. So I do think it's a new way to think about money. You're not quite clear yet of all the implications. I think maybe a last question there, uh, the blue sweater we no tengo más tiempo what? Eh, no tengo más tiempo el tiempo acá. está terminado sí muchas gracias muchas gracias un aplauso para bruno muchas gracias